Happy Sunday morning, church. I hope you're having a beautiful day today. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've already got to watch Brother Ed's uh, communion meditation. I hope you've got to watch my mother's Sunday school lesson. Um, it, those two do an amazing job, um, just like all of our leadership here at the church. And so we're so appreciative for all that you all do. You know, this week there's been so many people that's been reaching out, helping each other, cleaning getting some things ready for uh, for the future. And so we'll be keeping you updated on, on things that we're looking at for the future about when we're coming back. We're gonna err on the side of caution. We're gonna do some really smart things, but we want to see each other. We want to be together. Um, so we're gonna be talking more about that. So welcome. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. I hope that later you get to get outside and enjoy this beautiful day. I know I'm going to, but for now, we're gonna talk more about our sermon series called 40 Days with Jesus. This is week number two of 40 Days with Jesus. And so let's start out this morning with this idea of still in the grave. Now, um, I don't know about you, you know, when I was a kid, my, my parents used to drag me to a lot of cemeteries and, and uh, look at the tombstones for genealogy and family and things like that. And um, so I, I was always kind of used to kind of seeing tombstones and things like that. But I wanted to start off this morning with an idea of Abraham Lincoln. So some of you maybe have been to Illinois, maybe you've seen um, the tomb or the mausoleum of Abraham Lincoln. But everybody knows that Abraham Lincoln was our 16th president. You know that he was by far one of our greatest leaders that this country has ever seen. And you know that that, that he did he did an amazing job, did some amazing things, and he was assassinated in 1865 by John Wilkes Booth. So what something that you may not have realized is, you know, they made this beautiful ornate coffin for him and actually took him um, by train at you know, with the coach and everything like that, took him back towards Illinois to go be interred. And so there's actually some, some renderings and some drawings from about 18, you know, 65, when they were interring him at the, this, this cemetery. And, uh, and just this beautiful procession that happened. And the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that stopped when he would, you know, when his train would be coming through their town, they'd be coming to see him. And then they'd go and they'd sit and they'd watch him be interred at the cemetery. What you may not know about this story, it's kind of interesting. 22 years later in 1867, there were so many rumors flying around that Abraham Lincoln was actually not in the grave. That they tore the mausoleum apart. And they exhumed his body. They opened the casket. And Abraham Lincoln was still there. And so they close it back up, they put him back in the ground, they, they uh, take him to another mausoleum, and then what happens? 14 years later, so it's, he died in 1865, in 18, uh, 22 years later, 1867, or 1887, I mean, 1887, they dig him back up, and now 14 years later, in 1901, guess what? They dig him back up again, because... There were still rumors abounding that he was not in the grave. That's crazy, right? Both times, there were tons of witnesses that said Abraham Lincoln was still in the grave. This is a shot from, from the 1901 exhumation with a crane pulling his casket out of the ground. And so it's, it's interesting that, that both times these witnesses say that Abraham Lincoln was still in the grave. But yet on the third day of Jesus being dead, um, Similar rumors begin to spread throughout the life of Israel, and especially Jerusalem at that point. And there were, there were no witnesses who could say that Jesus was still in the grave. On the contrary, they're saying, he's alive. He's walking around. He's talking to me. This is amazing. Nothing like this ever happened before. So the, way, the thing I wanted you to think about this morning, starting out with this idea of going forward with 40 days of Jesus, as great as a president and a man as Abraham Lincoln was, if you called out to Abraham Lincoln today, you'd get silence. You can read his amazing you know, work and some of the things he wrote, but, but if, you, if you called out for help, you wouldn't necessarily get help, you'd get silence because Abraham Lincoln is still in the grave. But as a Christian, when we cry out to Jesus, we are instantly having access to power, to a peace, to an understanding that comes from God himself. And so, it's the power that changes lives, and it's, it's the peace that can calm a storm. And why is that? Because he lives. There's an old beautiful song, Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. That's a beautiful song. So welcome back to week number two, 40 Days with Jesus, where we're talking about these encounters 
that Jesus is having with his disciples right after the resurrection. So I want to throw something out there to you. Um, I wonder how your life, my life, our lives together, how would it change dramatically and transform if Jesus were physically here, standing in your presence, talking to you? Would that change you dramatically? It probably would if you were a Christian. Um, and hopefully it would change a lot of people even if they weren't Christians. But I believe that even though that would transform us, we're looking for the very first time today about how the risen Christ appeared to his disciples. His disciples were hiding behind locked doors. And then Jesus comes to be with them. And so the last couple of weeks, we've talked about how he showed himself to Mary Magdalene and the women on Easter Sunday morning, first thing in the morning, right? And then last week, we talked about the disciple Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus, the afternoon and early evening of Easter Resurrection Sunday. And if you remember, Cleopas is so excited that after they realize that they've been with Jesus, even though it's evening time and they just walked seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, what did it say they do? They get up and they're ready to go back and they go back to Jerusalem that night to go talk to the disciples and to show the amazing glory of Jesus of how that conversation that he had with them changed them, and that he's truly who he said he was, the risen Messiah. But you know what's amazing about this? It's still at the current time. At this point in the story, the disciples are still huddling together because of fear. Even though they've heard reports of the risen Jesus from the women, even though they, will, they would be hearing reports from Cleopas and his companion, they're still huddling together in fear, in fear that something terrible is going to happen to them. So I want you to see what happens here as we read John chapter 20, I'm reading just five verses here, verses 19 through 23, and it says this. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, then they are forgiven. If you do not forgive their sins, they are not forgiven. So we read how the disciples are gathered behind these locked doors for fear of the Jews. And you see, guys, it's one thing to hear secondhand reports about Jesus. It's something else to really experience Jesus for yourself. Something life-changing that nobody else can take away from you. Something that you just have to sit back and say, yep, that was God. There's no other ex explanation whatsoever. That was God himself that made that happen. That Jesus is still a miracle worker, and he's still making miracles happen in the lives of people. So today, I know for me personally, I love hearing the reports and the, the beautiful testimonies that the people in our church and around the world have. Um, but see, these disciples didn't just want secondhand reports. They needed a revelation personally in their life. And so Jesus came to bring it for them. Everything in that room changed for them on Easter Sunday evening, Resurrection Sunday, because Jesus shows up. And John, is, John just gives these very simple words. Jesus came and stood among them. Very simple. And so this wonderful little story shows us that Jesus, when he came, he did a couple of different things. First, he completely changed the lives of these disciples. And secondly, he commissioned them and gave them a mission for the rest of their life to begin the work of sending them out for his purpose. So I believe in so many capacities, Jesus still wants to do the same thing for us today. And all throughout the Bible, when we see these personal encounters that Jesus has with people, almost every time, unless it's a religious leader, and he still changed some of the religious leaders, but so many times, these people leave changed, completely changed, time after time and time again. So I believe so many times when Jesus comes, 
He comes to change us. These disciples would never be the same again after Jesus, and nor should we. So by changing us, one of the things we're talking about today is he, when he changes us, when Jesus comes to change us, he gives us a new sense. And that is a new peace, a new hope, and a new joy. So when Jesus comes to change us from our old self, the first thing that in this story he comes to bring is this. It's a new peace. A new sense of peace. The very first words that Jesus said were, peace be with you. And then again, if you drop down a couple verses to verse 21, it says again, Jesus said, peace be with you. So it's so important for him to talk about peace that he says it twice in the same conversation. Now, this is more than just a customary Jewish greeting. It was customary for Jewish people to say, peace be with you. But this goes even deeper than that. This wasn't just Jesus saying, hey guys, I got it all sorted out. Okay, you got nothing to worry about. I got it all fixed. You're good to go. It's more than that. This is coming from that Jewish concept of the word shalom. Shalom, peace be with you. It's actually more of an understanding that God wants to bring well-being and restoration for your life. If you'll let him, he wants to bring well-being and restoration. I mean, it's a peace that changes everything if you'll let it. So it's a phrase that kind of starts with us coming into a right relationship with God. Now, every one of us knows someone, it might be someone in our family, it might be a friend, it might be just someone that's, that's a close person that we work with. Do you see them in turmoil all the time? Do you see them without a sense of peace where everything is a struggle and everything is a tribulation? And they just don't ever quite seem to sense to have a, a sense of peace. How's their relationship with Christ? I'm not saying that that's the same way for every single person, the way that works out. But what I'm telling you is, is when Jesus comes to change you, he's trying to take your focus off of all of the stressors by giving you a new sense of peace. And it's a peace that's going to change how you relate to everybody, and it's a peace that's going to change how you deal with things in your life. It's a peace that it's not just going, it's not just going to overwhelm you where you have such inner peace, but it's also going to flow out from you to where that peace shows up in your workplace. That peace shows up in the conversations that you have. That peace shows up with your family at home. That's a peace that surpasses all understanding. That's what comes from Christ. And so he comes to give you that, and it's so important, he mentions it a couple times. So he doesn't want you to live in fear. These poor disciples were so struck with fear and despair that Jesus knew a personal revelation would ignite their faith so that they could do amazing things for the rest of their life. So he comes to replace all of your fears with a new sense of peace. So I hope that you're living with a new sense of peace today. And secondly, when he comes to change us, he also comes to bring us a new sense of hope. So bear in mind here, guys, that one of the primary, primary negative effects of the crucifixion on these disciples was that they had this sense that now everything's gone wrong. Wait a minute. We've been pouring our lives for three years into the work and ministry of this man. We've been following him around. How could this guy have not been the son of God with all the things we watched him do? And so that, that, that horrible, torturous crucifixion that they still didn't quite understand, they felt like that that was the end. Now this Jesus, Jesus movement is over with. All this time, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? So I'm going to stay stuck in fear. But after that peace that Jesus brings, he also brings a new sense of hope. And so he was wanting to show, just like these disciples, Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus that we looked at last week. You notice right away that when Jesus is still kind of disguised from their view and they don't know who he is. 
You hear Cleopas say, but we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. We had this huge sense of hope. And so after he said this, going back to the story with the disciples, when Jesus shows up in the midst with the disciples, what he does, how does he show them hope? He says, look, death didn't keep me down. There ain't no grave going to hold my body down. I am up and I'm alive and I am well. And do you want to see? Here you go. You can see. I'm not a ghost. You can touch me. It's all good. I'm going to ask for something to eat. I have a glorified, resurrected body that God gave me. And so it's a beautiful hope that when he went to the cross and died, and when he was risen again on the third day, that that power of death and darkness and the power that the devil held over that, chain break, took it apart. Jesus conquered it. Victory. What does that mean for us when it comes to hope? When you die, you're not going to stay stuck in death and darkness. You have something beautiful and new that's going to go with Jesus. You have something beautiful and new where you're going to be in the presence of your Heavenly Father forever. Our life is just a tiny little vapor. And then there's eternity. So if you don't have hope, one of the best things you can do for hope is not just for this time that you have on this earth. It's for something much bigger and much more eternal. Is your hope in Jesus? I hope it is. Because Jesus comes to replace all of your despair, all of your hurt and anguish. He comes to replace all of that with hope, if you'll let him. Their perspective totally changed for the disciples. When he comes to change us, he brings us new peace, new hope, and new joy. So in verse 20, it said this, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So I always think of this example from one of my favorite shows, Friends. It's Phoebe and it's everybody up and jumping around and they're so excited. So the disciples were overjoyed when they saw Jesus among them. The same Jesus with the same marks in his hands. The same Jesus with the stab mark in his side. Same Jesus with the marks through his feet. So you got to remember here, guys, that it's replaced. That fear and despair goes away. It's replaced with a joy that comes to overflow in our hearts. And we've said this before, but happiness and joy are actually different. They have different, different things that they really base themselves on. So happiness, as you know, is based upon your circumstance. What is happiness? Well, it's, a, it's an emotional roller coaster because it's, it, it's based upon how, you, how your day is unfolding. You know, did you wake up this morning and you didn't have any coffee in the house? Oh my gosh, I don't have time to go to McDonald's before they close, blah, 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 whatever it is. You know, that's, that's a joy. That's, that can be a lack of joy. Did you wake up today and you had a flat tire on the truck? Well, I've got to go change this flat. I'm going to go find a can to fix a flat. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Did you, did you have a dead battery in your truck? Oh, I've got to get somebody to jump my truck. I don't have any jumper cables. What am I going to do? Oh, my gosh, it's raining outside. Oh, I can't wear that thing I was going to wear. That's happiness. It's based upon your circumstance. Joy is much different. Joy is, is more of a permanent, eternal type of situation. Joy is something that can be instilled in us that it doesn't matter what the circumstance is. It's something that can last, everlasting. So here's a word of wisdom for you. Since happiness, since happiness comes from your circumstances, then it will always change. Happiness doesn't last. But since joy comes from the Lord, he never changes, then joy is everlasting. So you should wake up with joy every single day because he comes to give you new peace, new hope, new joy. So when Jesus came into the life of these disciples on Easter Sunday, he came to replace all of their agony with joy. And he comes to do the same thing for you. He comes to replace your agony with joy. And so Jesus comes into your life 
and he wants his glory to be shown all over the earth. He doesn't just want to change you and then it stops and it ends right there. When he changes you, he wants his glory to be shown. He wants you to be able to be able to tell others about this new peace, this new hope, and this new joy. And so he doesn't just come to change us. He also comes to send us. When Jesus comes to impact our lives, he also wants to send us. And so we are supposed to be given a commission and a new mission for our life. So by sending us, he gives us a new purpose, new power, and new authority. Today, at this very moment, I'm thinking about you and I'm thinking, do you know what your purpose is for this life? Now, you know, you all have heard me say before, joking, like when I was a kid, I'm going, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Well, you know what? Maybe I want to be an astronaut. And then it's like, I can't handle roller coasters and I get sick. And it's like, yeah, okay, you're probably not going to be an astronaut then. Um, okay, so what, do you, what else do you want to be? Um, I want to be on the Dukes of Hazard. I want to be one of the Duke boys. I want to ride in the General Lee. Okay, well, that's probably not going to happen. Probably not a goal that I should aspire for. So let's pitch that one out the window. Um, what else do you want to be? Well, I want to be a... I want to be a baseball player like Ozzy Smith for the St. Louis Cardinals. Okay, well, you've got to be really good at baseball. That may not happen exactly. Even though you're okay at baseball, you may not be the best at it. So there's been times all through our lives where we've gone and we've said, what am I going to do with my life? What am I supposed to do? What is my purpose? You know, when I went to college, I'm like, I still don't know what I want to do. I'm sitting in college class and I'm like, I don't know what I want to do. I have no idea. I know that I could work in, in a bank. I know that I could work in insurance. I could do a business administration degree for that. I could figure out what I'm going to do. But that's a job. That's just a job. It's not really a passion. It could be. But that's not really my passion. And so what I had to come to learn was kind of this revelation for me, uh, a real understanding that if I needed something more insightful. And it was... It was this, um, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So what is my purpose in life? Do you realize wherever you're at right now, you may not have ever given this any real thought before. Have you ever thought that somewhere your life purpose is ultimately wrapped up in God's purpose? That it's really not just about you, and you're not supposed to just maybe work and make money and die, although a lot of people do that, but there's actually something more and something better. And so this idea that Jesus gives us a new purpose, just like he did for the disciples, that is something that whenever you realize that your purpose is to let Jesus infiltrate your life, so that he can shine through you in every circumstance. So that whenever you are, whenever you're at your home life, your work life, your public life, or your private life, you're taking Jesus with you where you go. And he's shining through you. And then when that happens, you're truly living out these words of, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So in other words, the disciples were meant to continue the life-saving work of God on this earth. And that's amazing, right? I mean, it's amazing that these men and women were given that ability to do that. And so every one of us, if we're Christians in God's family, even today, then we are meant to continue the life-saving mission of God the Father through Christ the Son by the Holy Spirit. When we do that work, it changes things, and he sends us out to do an amazing set of work, amazing set of things. So we're given new purpose, and maybe that's to go and tell and love. That's pretty simple. Wherever we're going, we don't have to go, we don't have to go shove Jesus down people's throats, but we give them the good news by how we live our life, by how we speak, by how we appreciate, by how we show love. We go, we tell, we love. 
Love God, love others. Those were the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave his disciples. Love God, love others. And when we do that, we're really showing that Jesus is exuding from our life. But he doesn't just come to give us new purpose. He comes to give us a new power, a new sense of power. How many of y'all are feeling strong today back at home? Are you feeling strong? Some of you are going, no, I'm feeling like I'm pretty weak today. Well, guess what? Not all power is physical power. How's your spiritual power? Do you feel like you can get up and you can pray and you can make amazing things happen because of your faith? That is spiritual power. So he comes to give us new power. Look what it said in verse 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It's not just whenever we have power. It's not just about us trying hard. It's not just about physical power. That's not the kind of power that we're talking about. This power is about receiving something that is so much greater and more powerful than we can ever be physically. It's about receiving something beautiful through the Holy Spirit. And so maybe you're sitting and you're thinking, you know, do you realize that you can receive this power through the Holy Spirit? How do I do that? Have you ever asked for it? Have you made a decision about Jesus? Good. Have you asked for his power through the Holy Spirit to help you? If you haven't, then maybe you should ask. And maybe you should willingly receive. You know, when we become believers in Christ, it says that the Holy Spirit is sent to us. It indwells in us. But a lot of times people don't ever feel it. And it's because they don't really make it very welcome for the Holy Spirit to really indwell. And we've talked about that before in sermons in the past. You want to make it where the Holy Spirit feels welcome in a home so it can really work through you. And that's, that's about being filled up to the highest measure of Christ when we do that. And so do you realize that you can receive that power? Now see, there's going to be some of you today at this very moment where you're thinking, I don't know what this Holy Spirit power is for. I don't really get it. But think about this. What greater task does the Holy Spirit have than to empower the disciples of Jesus to be able to become more like Christ? Now, we will never be Christ. But how can we become more like the likeness of Christ? Loving God, loving others, making wise decisions, caring in all the way, showing the love of Jesus to others, going, telling, and loving. And so we bear witness to Christ in this way. The Holy Spirit comes and enables us and leads us and empowers us and guides us to overcome sin and learn obedience whenever we go through those, those, trial, those trials and those struggles. How many of y'all have been suffering from a big temptation or a big trial this week? There's a lot of us probably at home that have. Okay? And when that happens, where's your foundation? Is it back on Jesus? Are you asking God through his Holy Spirit to help you, to indwell in you even more, to let it be known so that you can do the very best that you can do to be more Christ-like? Resist the devil and he will flee from you? If you don't, if you're not asking for that, you may not be receiving it in the way that you could be. And so I want you to remember that you can receive that type of power to guide you and encourage you and empower you through trials and tribulations. You don't have to be selfish. You don't have to be cruel. You don't have to be self-seeking. You don't have to be driven by your temptations until you, you know, flesh, it just takes over and causes all sorts of problems. It doesn't have to be that way. You can have this amazing new sense of power that can overcome that. It's the power to love God and love others through his Holy Spirit. So Jesus comes to bring new purpose, new power, and new authority. So listen to these final words that Jesus says in, in this part. It says, if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, let's be very clear on this real quick. Newsflash, people, you are not God. <laughs> so... 
we are not given the power to go and forgive people their sins. That's not up to us to judge. That is up to the work of God to do that. Okay? So, the biggest thing that I want you to see about this is because we don't get to decide who's going to be forgiven and who isn't, um, we know that only the Lord has the power 